a couple more people to admit here. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Virtual School of Continuing Studies. My name is Ina Popova. I am the Director of Professional and Corporate Education at the School of Continuing Studies. And um, we have um, our guest today is uh, Stephen Hecht. He's a co-founder and chief executive peacemaker at Million Peacemakers. And Stephen uh, brings with him over 30 years of personal and business experience in conflict resolution. He's a co-author of a bestseller called Nonflict, The Art of Everyday Peacemaking. And it's our pleasure to have him today. He is a very proud McGill alum, and we are grateful that he gracefully accepted our invitation to host this talk. So over to you, Stephen. Well, thank you, Ina, and uh, it's really an honor to be here. Thank you, Dr. Wildean Well, for introducing me to Ina so that we could get together in this way, and to all of you for taking your time on this uh, Wednesday afternoon or evening. I see we have someone here from Mumbai as well. So yes, I am a proud uh, McGill alumni. Matter of fact, I, have a, I owe a lot to McGill. Um, I was the class of 80, and I re-met my wife uh, at the McGill 25th year reunion 15 years ago. So if not for McGill, I would not be happily married over 10 years and uh, doing what I'm doing because it's my wife that enables me to uh, uh, be a peacemaker full time. So um, I do, I have, have a lot of gratitude uh, to McGill. So the topic today of um, conflict and peacemaking is certainly timely. We appear to be in a world that has a fair amount of conflict and maybe more than usual with the COVID situation that we're in now. Uh, we're going to use the chat. I want, I want this to be quite interactive and, and uh, with each other and I'll try monitor the chat to the extent I can. So if you see my eyes moving to the right, it's because I'm looking at the chat. It's not because uh, I'm losing eye contact with you. So the, um, I'd like to get a feeling from, from you all uh, right now is how do you feel right now with the situation? Uh, COVID, are you uh, feeling fearful? I could tell you I'm feeling a lot of gratitude, but I'm also, I also have that mixed with fear. My wife has an autoimmune disease um, and being over 60 is in the high risk uh, group that we're concerned about. So I, I'm grateful that uh, we're at our cottage right now where I'm calling you from. And I've been here since February the 26th, uh, yet she also goes to the hospital every six weeks uh, for three days of infusions. And she, her hospital is the Jewish General, which is the uh, epicenter of treat, treatment uh, for uh, COVID. So there's concern about that. So uh, thank you for sharing. So David is feeling fine. S Selena is feeling blessed and apprehensive. Uh, Francis uh, keeping busy teaching. There's uncertainty, time to evaluate. Con conflicted, Ale Alexander is feeling conflicted. Yeah, we grateful and scared. There's a lot of grateful if we're, if we're feeling safe and, and there's a lot of anxiety there. And when we have this anxiety, how do you think it impacts us when it comes to conflict? Do you think we have more conflict or less conflict? More, yeah, much more. Thank you, Michael. Exponentially more. So, um, yeah, I'd say there is certainly more conflict. People being overwhelmed uh, with obligations. There's conflict at home. If you have kids at home, conflict. Being in a small space, I had, I was speaking to someone who's been married 30 years and she told me, I love my husband, this last week, I love my husband, but I effing want to kill him. That's a quote uh, that she said. And, and there's some conflict, and I never heard that word out of her mouth before, uh, which I abbreviated. So there's some people that are really um, feeling more conflict and more stress, be it at work, be it at home. Great. And that's totally normal. If you had to write the feelings, when you think of the conflicts that you have, put in the chat, what kind of feelings do you have around conflict? 
when you think of the conflicts you have, how does it make you feel? So there's frustration, anger, resentment, Raphael, frustration, fatigued, inadequate, annoyed, apprehensive, irritated, thank you, impatient, discomfort, bored, being locked up, anger, resentment, claustrophobic, yeah, tense, frustrated, annoying, so there are a lot of feelings around conflict. Conflict is very emotional. It's very emotional. And we have to deal with these feelings when we, we are dealing with conflict, both ourselves and with the people we're in conflict with, because they're, they're emotional too, right? We're not robots. We all have these emotions. Dr. Weil feels empowered. Ah, interesting feeling. Great. So conflict is emotional. Certainly is. If you had to think of the definition of conflict, what are we talking about? What is the definition of conflict? How will you define it? Put that in your chat. Disagreement, fundamental disagreement, confrontation. A lot of disagreement and confrontation, opposing goals. And in fact, there's conflict. If you had to look up conflict, there's disagreement and conflict over the definition of conflict. So we came up with our own definition, which is similar to what some of you folks are writing, which is when two or more different perspectives come into contact with each other. So is that glass half full or half empty? In my second wife's case, it was half empty. In my case, it was half full. I've had a lot of personal conflict. I'm married 28 years with three wives, little background. Um, so I have a lot of experience dealing with conflict and not necessarily in, in an ideal way. I also come from a third generation family business that had a lot of conflict. So uh, I've seen a fair amount of conflict in my, uh, in my life and a glass with bubbles would be nice, yes, maybe a little later. But when you look at the definition of conflict, what you see is it's neither positive or negative. It's just two or more different perspectives coming in contact with each other. And in fact, we need different perspectives for growth, for innovation, for learning. But how we deal with it is really important because if it's constructive, then we will have growth and learning. If it's destructive, uh, we're certainly going to be have harmful relationships. So the goal of today is to give us some tools to deal with conflict in a constructive way. All right. One important skill, and actually... I uh, learned this and taught this in McGill in an organizational behavior course that was student taught back in 1979 uh, is active listening. Many of us know what active listening is, uh, but we don't necessarily practice it. So when we actively listen to someone, eye contact is important. I know it's more challenging on the Zoom calls um, or especially on phone and email where you don't have eye contact or text messaging. So if someone's not looking at you in the eyes when you're talking to them, how do you feel? Put that in your chat. How do you feel when people aren't looking at you when you're talking to them? Dismissed, ignored, dismissed again, unheard. Yeah, there's something they're hiding. They're not being honest with us. They're not interested in what I'm saying. They don't care, they're untrusting. They're not listening to me at all. Great point. Yeah, so if someone's not looking at you and you're missing that human connection, they're not looking at you when you're talking to them, you might feel disrespected, right? If you're not, they're not paying attention, they're not even caring enough. Now, in some cultures, um, making direct eye contact might be disrespectful, so you look in the third eye. But typically, if people, and we're talking gentle, not glaring eye contact, when you're actively listening to someone, making eye contact of them is an important first component. And yes, maybe the other person's not uncomfortable, but we read, maybe they're shy. So these are things so we can't necessarily assume. But often if they're ignoring you, looking away, you're, it's not ideal. Being able to hear the other person. If you're in a loud room, although we're in fewer restaurants or bars these days, um, it's hard to, or if you have your WhatsApp tone going every second, you're getting a message, you have to be able to hear the other person. So that's the second component. Having an open mind 
to the other person's point of view. When we're in conflict, often we have a closed mind. We're only focused on our point of view. We don't realize that maybe there's another point of view there. So having an open mind and then having an open heart is important. Having empathy for the other person. The other person has feelings too. So those are four key components to active listening. Now, by listening to them, it doesn't mean that you're giving up your position, right? But giving them the respect and courtesy, and I, I think I mentioned feeling disrespected, or I didn't mention, feeling disrespected respected is a source of 90% or more of the conflicts out there, both in your lives and look at the newspapers, geopolitical conflicts. Often it's the leader feeling disrespected, causing wars. And then when you're listening to them, mirroring, you can mirror their body language if you're with them, mirroring the tone. So mirroring back the essence of what they said is an important skill. And our first go-to way often when we're listening to someone is to make it about us saying, oh, that happened to me, or that I really feel that without listening and then mirroring back what they, what they said and asking, did I understand you well? Again, you're not having to disagree with them or agree with them, but just listening to them is often enough to diffuse 90% or more of the conflicts out there. And it's something we could all do right away. Framing. We all have a different lens of viewing everything, of seeing facts. And our framing is impacted by our culture, our personality, our life experience how we were brought up and how we feel emotionally right then. So sometimes we wonder why doesn't the other person see it the way we do? Because they have different framing than we do. All 7.2 odd billion people in the world have different framing than you and I. And our framing might impact how we deal with conflict. If you had to think of one word, how you deal with conflict, how many people would choose flee or avoid conflict? Anyone here avoid conflict? You could put yes if you avoid conflict as a go-to way. Yeah. What are the pros and cons? A lot of people avoid conflict. What are the pros and cons of avoiding conflict? If you could put in the chat, what are the pros and cons? Not having to deal with uncomfortable emotions. Yeah, that's a pro but eventually it does come back. It doesn't go away, usually. The pro is there's no conflict right at that moment, less argument right then. Conflict, but it gets out eventually and probably could go the wrong way. Anyone have a conflict that they're avoiding, 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 and finally you just explode with emotion because you can't hold it in anymore because it didn't get resolved? Yeah, thank you. How many people use force or power? Anyone here use force or power? Do it or else. If you have more force, do it or else. I'll fire you. I'll leave you. Um, it doesn't have to be physical. It can be emotional. What are the pros? Yeah, with kids, a lot of us who would not necessarily use force uh, at work, but you say, do it or else, you know, or else you'll go to your room or, yeah, just screaming. It's another way of using force. What are the pros and cons of using force? or power. You have to go to alienate the other person, yeah. The pro is it's quick. If you have more power, there's an immediate response, but it could escalate. It could hurt the other party. You could live with regret. Doesn't resolve the problem. Doesn't help. The other person might look to use force on you one day, assuming it's a longer term relationship. If it's a one off relationship, maybe you could get away with it. But the longer term relationship, um, David, it poisons the relationship. Yeah, if you're always using force, it could poison the relationship and invites force by the other. And again, you see that in our relationships at home or at work or certainly geopolitically. I found you can't win a war necessarily. Eh? If they're not dead, they're going to come back and use force against you. Another way of dealing with conflict would be to fold. Just give the other person what they want. By the way, I have two dogs, so I use dogs, animals in some of my photos. Um, give the other person what they want. Fold. 
What are the pros and cons of fold? You don't get what you want. It, you do stop arguing. There's some satisfaction. The pro is the conflict is avoided. Yeah. All true. You don't get your need met if you're the one folding. Often we think that, and there's a winner and a loser, often we think that the other person will reciprocate when we fold. But because they got rewarded for you folding, they're probably less likely to reciprocate because people often do what they're rewarded to do on the rules of motivation. And then you resent them as, as we're saying, as I'm getting uh, feedback from, uh, from David. Yeah. Another way of dealing with conflict is 50, 50 or compromise. Just cut that lemon in half. You take your half. I take my half. What are the pros and cons of compromise? Just cut it in half. Lemon tastes bad. <laughs> they both get what they want, but they might get half of what they want. It is more fair than the others. It is more amicable than force or flee or uh, folding. Satisficing, good word, not adding value. It's compromise. Yeah, so I use a, uh, a case or a story in our book, which uh, was inspired by a, a McGill story from... Uh, called the ugly oranges, but in this case, uh, we called it lemons. Two chefs are fighting over a lemon. And one chef, one chef said, I had the lemon first and I need it. The other chef, no, I had it. I need it for my recipe. And they get emotional and they're getting angry and they're taking their knives out. And the executive chef takes his big knife out and cuts the lemon in half. So here, you take your half and you take your half. And he asked the first chef, by the way, what do you need the lemon for? I need the juice, for my recipe. He looks at the other chef. What do you need a lemon for? I need the zest, my recipe. Well, did you take the time to explain that to each other? You could have had all the juice or all the zest instead of this 50-50 solution of half the juice and half the zest. Classic example. Now, there is a time and a place for any of those uh, of the other ways. There's a time and a place for force. If the building's on fire, you're going to force everyone out of that building, right? If you're up against a, um, a bear, you might want to flee from the bear. Um, there is a time and a place if you don't really care about the outcome and it's a one-off relationship, you might, you might decide to fold. It's not worth, not worth your time right? or a time for 50-50. But if it's an important issue, an important relationship, and um, looking at power, you're, you're not going to get uh, massacred uh, by it and you have the time, there might be another way. And conflict is a way we're going to be talking about it. Let's take a poll now, just get a quick feel. What is your most commonly used conflict resolution style? We're going to end it in a few seconds. We're about 60% voted. Take another 10 seconds. Please vote if you haven't voted. Okay, we're going to end the poll. So we see 50-50, 40% of you choose 50-50 or compromise. About just under a third of you flee, 5% said you use force, folding 13% and other 15%. Okay, combo. And sometimes it could be a combo. Okay, great, thank you. When I do this with CEOs, I did this once with 700 CEOs in a room, about a third of them said they flee. And these are people that have the power to hire and fire. Um, they flee, a third of them use force, so more than this group here, and a third, uh, say 50-50, and none of them admitted to folding. So interesting, but in practice, I think there's more, uh, more folding than we see here. Great. One of the ways um, we talked about framing that influences how we deal with conflict is how our parents 
for the people that brought us up dealt with conflict. In my case, my mother was a forcer. She would yell and scream. And my father would just fold and give her what she wanted. So she got her word. So that's what she would keep on doing. She would use, uh, she would use force or power. She would yell, scream, uh, threaten, and, and my father would fold. Uh, if I would disagree with my mother and I didn't fold, I would um, sometimes have force used on me or implied force. So I, I, I learned, therefore, in my case, my go-to way might be to avoid conflict because I associated conflict with pain, with punishment. So I would tend to probably avoid conflict. So I'm going to do another poll now. Reflect on what you think and what was how your parents dealt with conflict and how it might influence how you deal with it now. Maybe you're like neither of them. Maybe you think you're gonna do the opposite of them, but often, sometimes you end up doing the same. Five more seconds. Great. So about 20% like your mother, 17 like your father, and 30% both, and a third or neither. Interesting. Great. Thank you. So it's part of our framing and keeping that in mind comes from, I want to take a minute to read this quote. So this is five years of business school education, undergrad and grad could be summarized in this quote. What's the real problem? Often we're in a hurry to think we have the answer to the problem without really understanding what the real problem is. Okay? I don't know if any of you could relate to that. Right? If I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about it and figuring out what it is and five minutes on the solution. And what we've been doing up until now is understanding ourselves a little bit more, why we might be the way we do, why, why we might feel the way we do, and why others might feel the way they do. Because understanding, as Einstein said, is probably 90% of the battle. So non-flip is a three-step process. It's simple but powerful. It was created by Dr. Mir Kafir uh, for an event I did for YPL when I was the regional education chair for the Canadian region in 2012. We started with 700 CEOs and their spouses and young adult children. And people were used it to resolve the toughest conflicts in their lives. And since then, uh, we've trained people in 130 odd countries. And it combines stuff that's already out there. You might have heard of Imago Marriage Therapy, positive psychology, change management, and coaching. So it combines stuff. I have books on each of those topics, and it's a three-step process that really instills things that are already out there. And we've worked with about 225,000 people in the five years since we started this. So what is non-flip? I'll take you through the three steps. Step one is to understand, this is from Einstein, understand yourself, yourself and your partner, the person you're in conflict with. And it's a very respectful model. Before you even get into it, you would want to say to the person you're in conflict with how that relationship is important to you and why you care about them. And you ask permission to engage in conflict. The way you would ask permission to give feedback uh, when you teach feedback theory, you want to get their consent before you just get right into conflict. So, um, Dad, um, I, I love you, or dear I, Naomi, I really love you, and we're having this conflict, can we deal with it? And I've got this model called conflict, can we try it out? 
and get consent. And then we could go through the questions. So you would share your facts and feelings around the conflict, because the feelings as we know are important. And the other person, and then you could share what's important to you. And then the other person would listen actively, like we talked about earlier, mirror the essence of what you said and ask to understand you well. And is there anything else? That comes from a MAGO, because usually there's, not usually, there's typically something else. What we think we're fighting about is rarely what we're really fighting about. I don't know if any of you could relate to that. Yeah. So you're going to, and often when we're in conflict, we're, we would start in a very different way. You would say, you did that, and why did you do that? And, you know, you're, you're, and you might use names and you, how can you insult me like that? And, and, and people, when you go, when you should people, you should do that, or why did you do that? We put them on the defensive, right? So it's not typically the ideal way of resolving a conflict. So this is a different way where you're going to share, well, when, um, and I'll use a real example that my wife and I uh, went through last week end actually we were walking around the lake and i um took my phone out a few times to look at emails and wants to look at the uh the directions and and she got really offended for some reason i don't know and she grabbed my by the third time i did it she tried to grab my phone out and i got really pissed how can you grab my phone out you take my phone away from my hand she's trying to grab it from me and i yelled at her and we had a bit of a uh, conflict i don't know if anyone could relate to that kind of conflict but she and I had that. And we said, maybe we should try non-flick because something got triggered here. So I shared, well, uh, what is the conflict? You know, I, I'm walking around, I'm looking at email and, and I felt very disrespected when you grabbed the phone out of my hand. And it's important to me that I sometimes like to look at emails and, and look at them. And I like also, I like maps. I used to be in real estate development. I like to see where I am exactly. So she listened, mirror the essence, asked, did I understand you well? Is there anything else? So she understood me well. And then is there anything else? After I felt listened to, after you feel listened to, you might be willing to open up what the other thing is. So I listened to her and I said, you know what? My mother used to do that. She used to, if she didn't like what I'm doing, she would grab it or stop me by force. And that really pissed me off. And I don't need a mother, I need a wife. I need someone to support me, not someone to uh, try and micromanage me. So that's what triggered me. That's what really triggered me. And then, and then she, and then she said, "Well," and I said, "Okay, now you share your view of the conflict." And by the way, the other person will near the essence and ask, "Understand? Well, is there anything else?" Until there's nothing else. So then she shared, "Well, you you took out your phone and you looked at your email, and I." have limited time with you, you're working all day and we were taking a walk and you're looking away from me. Um, I'm trying to talk to you and you're looking at your phone and you keep getting beat and it makes me feel disrespected. And what's important to me is we have the quality time together where it's all about me <laughs> or us and, and not about your, you know, what's happening at work. You know, we have an hour to, to spend together. Can we not just do it together where I feel that you're there for me and with me? So I mirror the essence of what she said and ask, okay, and do I understand you well, which I did, is there anything else? And it came out that there is something else. What you're doing is what my father, she's saying, used to do to me um, when it was, um, for many times she would, she would feel unempowered, unimportant by her father or disrespected by her father. Uh, when she wanted to, what bedtime she would choose, or in many different instances, we won't get into it now, but I reminded her of the triggers her father comes, and this comes actually from a MAGO uh, marriage therapy, often the conflicts we're having are things oh, that weren't well, resolved with our parents. Sure untoward happened. That's fine, but then I need to do that before. Um, okay. we, can you mute yourself, uh, whoever is talking? Great. So that's step one. We're taking the time to understand what the real problem is. Step two is we go and we discuss together. We're no longer mirroring each other. We discuss and try to understand our shared reality. In step one, 
we're finding there's commonality. We're building trust and understanding in step one. When you take the time to understand and listen, you're building trust, right? We didn't try to solve the problem yet. We're building trust and we discuss together now what's our real underlying conflict. What's our real underlying conflict? And as Einstein said, if you don't, if you don't resolve the real problems, you're probably going to keep going on and on again. And this might take time, and you might even have to go back to step one if you didn't get to what the underlying conflict is versus the symptoms of the conflict. Then we go into, and after we get agreement on what is the real underlying conflict, we're going to discuss together what's working well for us. What can we appreciate about the other person or about the conflict, even if we're just willing to talk to each other? So obviously we have a, we love each other. We, um, by the way, in my wife's and my case, the real underlying conflict was that um, a lack of communication about what was important to us before and, and, the, and, and the fact that we didn't understand that we had these important triggers about the idea of being respected. Um, what's the real underlying conflict? By the way, there's a question where someone doesn't want to share during the understanding phase. Um, give them time. Uh, it might not be the right time in the heat of the moment might not be the right time. Isn't the right time actually not to avoid the conflict, but wait till things calm down a little bit. Let's say, let's take some time and just reflect what went on there and then talk about it. Agree to talk about a time when things are calm out of the heat of the moment. So that's a good question. Often if we're not willing to share, we might be so angry. We need time to calm down. So what's working well for us? What could we appreciate about each other? This puts us in a better state of mind to deal with the conflict. Next question is what's working well? What's our worst case scenario and how would it feel if we can't resolve this conflict? Um, in a relationship, we might grow further and further apart. We'll stop communicating. At work, if it's a work conflict, worst case scenario is one of us or both of us get fired. I had that situation with, um, with a lawyer and a sales person, head of sales and a head of legal for a firm and they were in conflict together had a lot of conflict. And uh, the worst case scenario is they realized they both would lose their job and they didn't want that. They needed their job. Um, and that gives us motivation for change. That's from change management. Often we need a real or perceived crisis to take action toward change. And now we're gonna focus on the best case, but half the people are more motivated by worst case and half by best case. Now we're gonna focus by best case. So what's our best case scenario and how would that feel? Visualize it, close our eyes, visualize. What would our ideal reality be and how would it feel? Well, in the case of a marriage, a relationship, a partnership, we would uh, really love to be together. We would enjoy our time together. At work, we would really enjoy the people we come to work with. We would respect each other. Um, we would co-create, work around the vision of the company, the organization. What's our best case scenario? In the case of uh, my wife, we, wouldn't, we would bring out the best of each other. We wouldn't try to change each other. That's my best case. We enable each other to be the best we could be. We wouldn't feel judged or put down. How would it feel? It'd feel amazing. Then what are the obstacles to achieve that best case scenario? We discuss all the obstacles. We work on all the obstacles, whatever they are. Then we look at the obstacles of the ones that we could control or influence. What could we do to overcome them? So certain obstacles might be out of our control. They're only 24 hours in a day. Um, the weather is the weather. Stock market is the stock market. Some things are out of our control. But of the obstacles that we can control, so in the case of my wife and I and our, the obstacles, our best case scenario is we would spend that quality time together. Um, and we would feel we're there for each other. The obstacles to achieve that is I get emails and, uh, and uh, uh, okay, what can I control? Can I, what can I do overcome the controllable obstacle? Well, I could control um, what I do with emails. I could go like right now and put my phone on do not disturb. So I'm with you or I'm with her 100%. I'm not gonna be disturbed by a beep. And we decided to do it right then and there. So we did that for our next walk. And now when we have our walks, which we try to do um, every uh, day or two, uh, we're there. We put our phones on do not disturb. It's not going to be the end of the world if we miss a few emails or texts. And that's what we did in that case. And the same thing would apply to any work conflict or any geopolitical conflict. It's the same model for anything or even an internal conflict. 
I use this to decide to um, to leave a career in real estate to uh, start a nonprofit. Many of you um, have work experience or, or work and 85% of you do experience conflict with work, which does impact productivity, work effectiveness, morale. The average employee spends 2.8 hours a week in conflict and the average manager spends 25% of their time dealing with conflict. So this, this skill is really important. So after seeing the impact it had on people, um, and I tried it in a very tough conflict. I went uh, uh, to a Palestinian refugee camp, and I'm a Canadian Jew, and I went with my wife and stepson to get out of my own comfort zone. And I saw women activists who be, started very hostile to me to after four hours of going through this workshop to be willing to make peace with their Israeli uh, Jewish neighbors. And I, and I realized if they're willing to take a risk uh, for freedom, uh, the least I could do is um, do the same. And I saw this as a gift to the world that I needed to share. And, and uh, five years ago, I co-founded Million Peacemakers with a vision of a million people co-creating a culture of peace in the world. So Dr. Mir Kafir and I co-authored a book in 2016 uh, called Nonflict, The Art of Everyday Peacemaking. Those are our hand of our first uh, retreat um, on the front of it. Uh, to plan it, and it's a simple, easy to read uh, book. Any word over three syllables, I question. Uh, it's a Marathi. Uh, we have a champion uh, that's just to the upper of the English book. Um, there are 100 million people, uh, and I and I see we have a friend in Mumbai here to speak Marathi, and we started, uh, or he started, Abhijit Pawar started a women's group called Tanishka Women. There are over 250,000 women now that are engaged in conflict and supporting each other in conflicts they're having at home and they choose community conflicts. Then it got duplicated with college students called Young Inspirators. Um, the book is in Spanish. We came up with a uh, Spanish edition when we worked with Danon Spain in conflicts they were having at their, at their office and then bring it to the rest of the group. And we were on the cover of Cosmopolitan Spain actually when it launched. Last year I was at the Vatican, that's Cardinal Turkson, the, um, head of the Diocese of Integral Human Development in charge of peace and uh, refugees. And they invited me to come speak at a uh, conference on religions and the UN Sustainable Development Goals on how religious leaders can make an impact using conflict to achieve changes in the world, um, be it a, from climate change to equal gender equality. And then they invited me back to speak uh, to a group on uh, peace and nonviolence uh, a month later. And the Pope got a copy, we had an audience with the Pope who got a copy of the Spanish book. We're working with Amazon. We're talking about collaborations now on how to scale, uh, sharing it uh, virtually with people such as yourselves and then other ways of scaling it virtually. We're working with Amazon now for uh, an Alexa skill. So uh, it's in final beta. So if I say, Alexa, open the Nonflict Coach. Welcome to the Nonflict Coach. I can help you learn various concepts of the non-flict way. I can guide you through the process or you can continue where you left off. How can I help? Alexa, exit. So basically, um, we have a workshop in a box now with, uh, with Alexa and it's going to be launched probably in a week or two. Uh, we're just fine all beta and if anyone's interested and has an Alexa device, there are over 200 million in the world, you'll be able to have Alexa walk you through a conflict using the non-flict way as well. Give you a, a mini workshop if you want that. This is a McGill story I'll just share and then we'll, uh, we'll be finished. So I, I chaired the advisory uh, board of a program at the School of Social Work called ICANN, Inter International Community Action Network. And they bring in students from the Middle East um, to do their MSW and one year at McGill and one year they go back to one of 11 community centers in the region. And I hosted them here at my cottage and for, for a weekend when they right got off, just got off the plane. And the person on the right uh, in the circle, they introduce themselves. The person on the right says, hi, my name is Amit uh, Kitain and I'm a uh, Jewish Israeli Zionist. And and we had Palestinians there, Jordanians, and, and this person on the left of him, Adnan, says, well, I'm a Syrian Muslim, and all I know about you is you're the enemy not to be trusted. And um, 
Amir says, well, I, all I know about you, Syrians, you're the enemy not to be trusted. And they hadn't met each other before, never met a, another person from, from the other side before, yet they hated each other. So I had them uh, do an active listening exercise where they would share an event or person that had a major impact in their life and why. And I paired them up. And um, I paired them up and I stood by to make sure that nothing bad would happen. And Amit uh, shared, well, um, growing up, my brother, Tom, my elder brother, he was my hero. He had my back. And uh, one day when Tom was, um, when I was 12, Tom was like every Israeli in the army. We get a knock in the door and we're told Tom is dead. He died in a helicopter crash over Lebanon with 75 other Israelis. And the pain that I felt in my heart, I feel every day and I would not one of my worst enemy. And I've none, you could tell he was impacted, he mirrored that back. And then I've none shared. I was living in Dara where the nonviolent revolution against Assad started. And kids uh, were arrested for graffiti, doing anti-Assad graffiti on the walls. They were being tortured in jail. And we were protesting the street. And my older brother's a doctor. The forces started shooting into the audience. And my brother started tending to one of the wounded. And I saw my brother shot in the head in front of me. And the pain that I felt and feel now, I would not want on my worst enemy. And they uh, cried together at that moment and hugged and they became brothers. They understood, they shared their common reality just by taking the time to actually listen to each other. The common grief, which is so powerful. We all want the same thing. We all want to feel respected, understood, safe, loved, and have hope for the future for ourselves, our children, and grandchildren. That doesn't matter what culture. I've been around the world. I've shared this around the world in every culture. Everyone wants the same thing. And focusing on our commonalities instead of our differences, going through this process is a way of resolving pretty much any conflict. So if it's an important conflict, important issue, important relationship, then um, please give it a go. So uh, thank you. You are all now peacemakers, or you can be if you practice it, learn it. If you want, I am able to offer you a free book, a free ebook. You see my email over there, asect at millionpeacemakers.org. I'm happy to send you. Just tell me if you want a Kindle version, an iPad version, a PDF, and I'll send it to you as a thank you for uh, joining me today and joining us today. Uh, feel free to... Uh, Check us out on uh, Facebook or our website. And if you have any questions, I know our time is tight right now. We're a little over. You could email me any questions. I'd be happy to engage with you um, for any questions that you have. Stephen, I think we have one question from Melanie. How do you enable the non-flick method when all you see is red? So conflict is emotional. And Take time to, when you see red, it wouldn't probably be the time right then to use it. Take time to calm down a little bit, reflect, go through in your mind. Actually, a good exercise is how do you think the other person would answer these questions? Put yourself in their shoes for a minute. And often when you put yourself in their shoes, you'll have empathy for the other side and then be able and ready. And it would be a good time at that point to engage in conflict. Wait till you're not seeing red. Thank you. So um, I thank you again very much for, for attending. If there are no other questions right now, um, I'm not, okay, I see you're putting your emails in the chat. Send it to me in an email here. I'm going to um, type in my email address right now, or in this, you're going to be able to share my contact information, email yes. with everyone, and tell me if you'd want, uh, what version you would want it in, okay? A million. And if you want to be kept up to date with when um, Alexa comes out, which is free, by the way, we're a nonprofit. Uh, we charge companies who could afford it. And we uh, like Robin Hood and, and do it free for organizations or nonprofits that can't, for people that can't. And we've got coaches. We've got about 25 coaches uh, do it in Spanish or English or French or Italian or Marathi. We have another question, uh, Stephen, from Susan. What to do when the other part doesn't want to collaborate in the process? 
So you can't force someone to collaborate in the process. Our strategic positioning for, for our organization is for those who desire peace, Million Peacemakers enables global transformation by reframing conflict into non-flict. Our target market is those who desire peace, uh, but if someone doesn't collaborate, you might want to try put yourself in, juice, in their shoes and understand why they don't want to collaborate. And I had a, I don't know if I have time to tell you a quick story. My daughter uh, and I early days got into a conflict and, and uh, I had, she had a Blackberry phone early days of Blackberry and she was very proud of it. And she said, uh, and, and she earned it with her own money and but she went off to Australia with a boyfriend and didn't need the phone because it didn't work in Australia. She came back after break up with the boyfriend and I'd given the phone to my son who needed a phone. And she came back and said, where's my phone? And, and I said, I'm sorry, I gave it to Alex. And um, I thought you'd be in Australia and you wouldn't need it anymore. How can you give your phone, my phone, my phone that I earned with my money to Alex? That's not fair. You're not right. And, and I thought, well, this would be a time for non-flick. It was early days of non-flick. So I said, Jacqueline, can we do non-flick together? And she said, fuck non-flick and shut the door. Excuse my, my uh, language. But that's what happened. And she slammed her door. And I said, wow, it doesn't work when the other person doesn't want to engage. So I, I let things cool off till the next day. And knowing she won't want to go through the process, I, I uh, took her out for dinner and had her attention showed her the respect that she felt disrespected before. And I, and I asked her the questions and then I mirrored the essence of, you know, facts and feelings it was really important to you that you earned the money for that phone, Jack. And right. Yes, it was. And you had no right to give it away. So how do you feel? I feel fine now. Well, she didn't feel fine when we got to, and so I neared her back and asked, did I understand you? Well, is there anything else? Yes. You love Alex more than you love me because I had offered to go get her a new phone. That wasn't going to solve the underlying question, the underlying problem. So by asking the question, even though she didn't know she was going through this process and going through those questions and nearing her, I got to the underlying issue was she thought that I loved my boys and Alex more than I loved her. And getting her a new phone wasn't going to solve it. That's how I initially wanted to solve it. So you, you could direct it when the other person's ready to feel listened to. And very, very intuitive, right? There's nothing, uh, when you go through it, it says, oh, it's logical, these questions, it's just logical, but it's a step-by-step -step process rather than all over the place. Any other questions? Are we good? I don't think we have any more questions. So um, thank you very much for today's talk. I'm sure everyone appreciated it and got quite a few insights on how they can manage conflict. And we will be sharing uh, the recording of this uh, talk today with everyone and uh, Stephen's uh, contact details will be there. So feel free to send your questions if you have more. I'm sure Stephen will gracefully answer them. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.